I was in Singapore covering the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And uh, we went there because of your friend, Jerogi Mundari, because Mundari was uh, at, at the start of the campaign where he wanted to stop Britain from selling arms to South Africa. South Africa's position was we wanted those arms because we wanted to make the Indian Ocean laneways safe to the British. How are they going to make the laneways safe? By having a few cannons around. So we got it, we got it to go to the United Nations, we got it to various, uh, various international bodies, and then we ended up in Singapore. Unfortunately for Mungai, a very clever guy called Sir Alex Douglas Hume came up with the idea that because this is a family of nations, only the fathers of the nations should sit down and discuss this issue. The problem with that was that most of the fathers of the nation did not know very much about the Yams campaign. So in a very simple procedural motion, the, camps, you know, the, 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 the whole campaign was thrown out. So imagine Milton Obode was the president of Uganda. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the, the Prime Minister of Singapore, a few other Prime Ministers all coming towards us, and we, the journalists, sitting there. And as soon as they stopped there, I looked at the uh, I put my hand up, and I said, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Milton Abode a question. And I said, Dr. Abode, how you, who are the who are the fathers of, of African nations, allow yourselves to be bamboozled by a simple procedural motion by Britain and throw the arms that they out of the window. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, that man is Cyprian Fernandez, but he's a colonial stooge. <laughs> <laughs> so most of my British journalists went and said, answer the question, answer the question. He turned around and said, do you think I look like stupid? <laughs> and he turned around and he walked away. I went to Hong Kong, Tokyo, and all that. While I was in Hong Kong, I got to hear that. I met, actually, I was thinking of the Miramar Hotel, which had eight lifts. And at each of these lifts, there was, there, was a, there was a little cubby hole bar. It was so stupid, because if you went up to your room, there was a table in the bar there. Anyway. So there's this guy who looked at me and said, Hey, you, black buster, come here. I said, uh, I said to myself, skip, don't leave him, he's bigger than you. <laughs> so I went along and I said, I said, yes, I said, I want to buy your drink. And he said, it was a very strong Dutch girl. And I said, why? He said, oh, I'm celebrating. And there's another, another gorilla in power. I said, uh, I, I buy my own drink. He said, no, 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 you'll enjoy this one. And I said, why? He said, because you look like an African. <laughs> I said, take a look. <laughs> anyway. And I said, okay, tell me what happened. He said, oh yeah, there's a new gorilla in charge of the <laughs> And I said, okay, tell me the truth and I have a question. He said, you were here on uh, South African Navy ship, commercial ship, commercial ship. And he said, just heard of the ladies that were schooling again. So I said, all right, I had a drink with an upstairs in my room, ran up the airport for three weeks. I wished there were planes directly for Kenya. He said, there were three flights, and it was very strange. They were to Singapore, it was one to Kenya. I'm holding the first class seat, can I have a ticket? He said, no way. The whole first class has been coming here. And in those days, first class was separated by just a curtain. So I asked him, can I have the first seat? And she said, uh, you can have the whole of the rest of the plane. <laughs> I said, fair enough. <laughs> so we flew to Singapore, and I was standing on the step side at the top, and I said, look, the boy come up. And then, from that moment, when I chronicled everything that he was expecting, he knows the Russian tears, Russian the radio, and then he gave me one quote. He said, Don't leave me alone, said, I'm going to a private hell on my own. So I went to Nairobi, wrote that story. The next day I got up, went to Sir Ibu Birbai, the car, taxi wallets, got a car, told the driver to sleep in the back seat, went to Uganda, went west first, all the way to Mutakula, and you know, on that border, there's no white line saying this is Uganda, this is Tanzania. So people are running in all sorts of directions. <coughs> and then I found that the, the Tanzanian soldiers were already digging it. And on the other side, Idi Amin's soldiers were digging it. I came back to Kampala, and uh, 
I went to the tree where God's supposed to have come to eat your meat. But on this particular day, there was a little toad of pissing on it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, God couldn't possibly have come to the guy. Then I went to Bodhi's mother's village, actually, and then went to his wife's village in Lengo, came back to Ampala. And by that time, my whole body was covered with very light mocha dust. And I thought Mutukula said it by Stephanie and Fernandez. And then the door burst open, and six guys, six of these army guys came in with their machine gun. And as they burst in, I tapped my left hand. They caught me and hit the send button. And then I put my hand over my head, and I started walking with it. But inside there was a jeep. And all the way to Parliament House, and at Parliament House, there was a captain there that I had known, and he looked at me and said, Mr. Fernandez, what are you doing, stupid kid like that with your hands on your head? Don't you know that you're the honorable guest of His Excellency Field Marshal Idi Amin, the <laughs> first genuine president of Uganda? And I said, uh, I said to myself, why didn't somebody tell me that? Because they put me to shit because I, I was up, I gave my life away for the dirty life. Anyway, they, they took me, they, I ran up to the cabinet room. And in that cabinet room was a very large ebony table. Some of you did the gun. And even in Kenya, do you remember the black ebony stuff that you did? If you polished it, you could actually see your face in yeah. it. And the I army mean, was black as charcoal. But you could still see a reflection of his face in that avenue table. Anyway, when I called him there, he came out and he said, uh, Mr. Fernando, the number one reporter from Kenya, welcome to the Uganda, the three Uganda. And he said, uh, uh, I said, Fernando, you, you went across the border. He said, yes, I went to the border. He said, what is happening there? Well, the people are running that side, and the people are running that side. And he said, that is good, sensible people. He said, but, uh, he said, but the Tanzanians are digging in there. And he said, ah, don't worry about that. My sums will get there. He said, Mr. President, what are sums? <laughs> he said, surface to air missiles. <laughs> so I said, thank you, Mr. President. Can I quote you? <coughs> he said, I thought that is why you are here. <laughs> he said, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> he invited me to sit. That is when I made a horrible mistake. Having driven for nearly 24 hours, my body, as I said, was covered in dust. Some of it was red ochre, and I was thirsty as hell. So I asked him for a drink. He gestured, he gestured to foreign minister of Anumaki Bedi to oblige him. He returned with a crate of Fanta orange, at least an inch of dust on the bottom, right? So I looked at him, I said, Mr. President, could you oblige me with something stronger, please? Uh, and he said, one of his, one of went off again. And he came back with beer, and there was also another inch of dust. But by that point, I was beyond carrying on, you know, if I didn't have a drink, I was going back. So I said, when I sat there drinking the beer, I suddenly remembered that TV on me was a Muslim. They don't, they don't support the church, it's not me. But that could be Muslim, they might get that. I don't think it was a practicing Muslim. No. No. <laughs> uh, they don't have a practicing Muslim. Remember, it was the army, the British army. I sat there for nearly two and a half, half an hour and listened to the biggest pack of lies I've ever heard in my life. He told me that he was out hunting and soldiers came to him armed with tanks and told him they had made a coup and wanted him to lead the gun. He denied he had masterminded or led the coup. I'm a simple, I, I'm a simple soldier. There was no mention of his riding head, but he gave me a quote that I've never forgotten. Uganda is, uh, I would say, corrupt. <laughs> Ministers? Corrupt. The civil servants, those Karanis, they are corrupt. Everybody is corrupt. I want to clean up Uganda and give it back to our people. 
as innocent as a baby that has just come out of his mother's womb. <coughs> you know what he did to me, that is not I liked the guy. He was simple but sincere and he was a bit genuine, genuine about being up together. He also said he wanted to get rid of communism, socialism, and all those anti Western ideas. I went back to my compile office and called the assassination and wrote the story. I cannot say that I died a thousand deaths in that jeep. I must have lost my French phone because my French phone is turned out. So that's life. So I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, can I ask you, please? Uh, 